Word of God uh, for meditation on this day when we rally uh, together to uh, build up one another as members of the body of Christ is recorded for us in Paul's letter to the church at Rome, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. And always bear in mind that this is uh, one of the great books in the New Testament where Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, reveals that God declares the ungodly, godly, for Jesus' sake. The unrighteous, righteous, for Jesus' sake. And that is what moves us ultimately to believe this good news. Romans 12.1, Paul writes, In light of this good news, and so many other good things you know about God's love in Christ, in light of all of this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual sacrifice. On Tuesday evening, I was expecting to catch a plane uh, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and to do a puddle jump uh, over to Chicago at O'Hare Airport and come to Columbia and end up there about 9.30 in the evening. I checked in at the desk there to get my ticket approved, and all of a sudden I approached that uh, gentleman at the desk, and he informed me that the flight had been canceled. Without a crumb of mercy, he did hand deliver the unexpected news. Your flight has been canceled. You're kidding, I said. And then he did pan again. No, I would never kid about something that's so serious as this. What was interesting was there was no, I'm sorry, <laughs> there was no, let's see what we can do for you. There was no, we will do the best we can to get you to your destination. By the way, we'll give you $100 for your next flight on our airline. Not a drab of mercy. Not a drip of mercy. Not a drop of mercy. Mercy. I watched that same scene two days later. It took me two days. I had asked him anything for tomorrow. Nope, it's all booked out. And again, dead pan, you know. Well, what about January 1st, 2015? Well, I watched the same scene take place at O'Hare Airport in Chicago two days later when I was getting a replacement uh, flight. The two men who found out that their planes had been canceled, they were wanting to get to Detroit, got very angry and they blurted out some word that had something to do with manure. And uh, they tried to scapegoat people there. And when I found out the news that I wasn't going to be able to go, the first thing I did, I was getting always a little shocked and surprised, but I, I said a little prayer. Okay, Lord, I'm not in control of my schedule. Uh, you're in control. Help me to latch on to Romans 8.28. We know that in all things you work everything, everything together for the good of those who love you. And so you obviously have something in store for me that I don't uh, understand. So help me walk by faith and know that you will work everything together for the good. Getting back to the man at the desk there, uh, who is uh, sorely lacking any mercy. Uh, I was tempted though, I had a sinful moment. Uh, you know, you get snarky and you gotta put down the old Adam. I wanted to say, I guess you don't believe much in Matthew 5, 7. And he would write, what, what's that? Uh, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. But that would have been sinful, not helpful. So, in love, I beat up my old Adam and kept my mouth shut. But at any rate, I hung on to Romans 8.28 and I said, okay, let's see what happens. And God granted many blessings in that two-day uh, detour that I had. Uh, as it turned out, uh, again, God was so good and kind. And the whole theme of our text here today is simply this. We who have received such great mercy from God through Jesus Christ, the mercy seat of God, are to in turn show mercy to one another. We are not to be so turned inward about ourselves, we can only think of ourselves, but we are to look around and we are to see a hurting humanity 
and so many opportunities for you and me who have received the forgiveness of God, the salvation of God in Christ, the gift of righteousness and mercy to now show mercy to one another and not be turned inward in looking only for ourselves. We are to be maidens of mercy, we are to be men of mercy, we are to be ministers of mercy in this horribly hurting world, offering cups of compassion to people thirsting for love and wanting to know the Lord of love. We, by nature, live in a world that is very short on mercy, quick to violence, and pervasive with apathy. When Jesus, true God and true man, came into the world, he was the perfect embodiment of mercy. He was not only Messiah, but he was mercy in flesh made manifest. In Jesus, by his kindness, his compassion, he stunned people. Continually in his ministry, he did things that were just so loving, so kind, so merciful. Can you imagine the reaction of people when Jesus put his healing hand on a man who had leprosy that people would not even come close to, let alone touch? Jesus performed such deeds of mercy. We're all familiar with the story of the woman that was caught allegedly in, in adultery. And the religious leaders and other people were going to take her out and stone her to death. But Jesus intervenes. And he says to the people, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And the people, one by one, began to drop their rocks, drop their stones. Jesus, in mercy, saved the life of that woman. But the people who dropped the stones had to be thinking in their mind that they too would want to be judged by mercy as well. And then Jesus gave the gal beautiful law and gospel, or we would say gospel and law. He said, you know, your sins have been forgiven, go and sin no more. And that's the tension of the Christian, the whole life. God has forgiven all our sins. 2,000 years ago on the cross, God in flesh, the mercy seat of God, Jesus, forgave us all our sins. And daily we receive that gift. Richly we have received that gift in holy baptism. And now God wants us to take that gift and drown our sinful nature. And day by day we receive the loving camp command, go and sin no more, even as God for Jesus' sake, constantly forgives us all our sin. By nature, we live in a world where we are hounded and harassed by laws, not tempered by mercy. We have to fill quotas. We have to earn grades. We have to fill out papers or else. We have to get up at 5.30 in the morning or go to bed at 1.30 in the morning after work in one extreme or the other. In the opening hymn that we were singing about, O Day of Rest and Gladness, I was thankful in my heart uh, for the very fact Jesus, by coming into this world, brought about a day of rest. Most people do not realize that had Christ never come into this world, human nature, being what it is, would treat people like cattle, treat people like, uh, you know, chattel, and never give anybody a day of rest. The very fact that we have a day of rest comes and falls from the cross of Calvary from the Sabbath rest day, Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus not only brings us forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation, but the gift of rest, and how wise it is that we get that rest to restore our body. But we are harassed by a world short of mercy. Do this, or you will be fired. Do this, or you won't be hired. Hackers show no mercy. I mean, hacking into somebody's computer, stealing their identity, that's not mercy, but that is hate, that is sin, and that causes so much trouble. The group ISIS, a religious fanatical group, showed absolutely no mercy when they beheaded that journalist. Hamas shows no mercy toward the people of Israel, let alone their own people by willing to put their own people in harm's way to be murdered and killed by their indirect actions. 
I think of porn kings, despicable porn kings, who take young children, bring them across the border so they can make millions and billions of dollars by sex trafficking. There's no mercy there. That's the religion of hell. And so the world we live in, whether drug dealers on the one hand, whether porn kings on the other, whether Hamas or ISIS or any number of groups trying to get control over people and treat them in indecent ways, we, we, we see the world moves a different way than the mercy of God, the love of God, and the kindness of God in Jesus Christ. And here we have to see why is the world so short on mercy. Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is this, all the religions of the world teach that you get to heaven by what you do. Christianity teaches we get to heaven by the mercy of God, through the Son of God, through the love of God, who gave His life for you and for me. So mercy will only come from the fountain of God's love in Jesus Christ, and really, ultimately, nowhere else. Our lives as Christians are to be characterized by mercy. God's mercy to us in Jesus is to move us to be merciful and kind and helpful to one another. The Father, out of the depths of His riches of mercy and kindness and compassion, sent Jesus into the world for you and me. Jesus, in His great mercy, died for you and me. He willingly died for you and me. He willingly went to hell for you and me. And then in His great mercy, He sends the Holy Spirit into our lives to call us by the Gospel and to be also our great interceder for us. God declares us righteous by grace alone. He baptizes us into Christ's death and resurrection. Beautiful, bountiful gifts. And He gives to us these great gifts through the sacraments. More mercy to settle us, to sturdy us, to strengthen us, to soothe us. Therefore, we are to live lives of mercy. And this is why Paul says, I appeal to you by the mercies of God in Jesus Christ that you don't conform to this dog-eat-dog -dog world, but you be conformed by the love of God to the crucified Savior to show mercy to one another. How does that life look? It's a life where we don't take revenge. It's a life where we, because we have been freely forgiven, don't hold on to grudges because God does not put our sin against us. It is a life where we are to serve one another and go opposite of the predator ways of the world. It is a life where we are to speak the truth in love and that we are to confess God's mercy in Christ. The challenge is every day, because the world seeks to warp us and wound us and destroy us, we have to take the story of Christ's love and put it at the forefront of our mind so that the Holy Spirit can rinse our mind, renew our mind, restore our mind, and that at the forefront of our mind we are moved by the mercies of God in Jesus Christ. At the end of our reading today, Paul talks about performing deeds of mercy with cheerfulness. And that is one of the great things in life. Whenever we can help somebody and we can do it cheerfully, it's really not only a great thing for the person, it's not only a good thing for them, it gives glory to God, but it's such a good thing for you and for me. God loves a cheerful giver, we are told. And this is what makes the world a better place. When the generosity of God through Jesus Christ flows through our veins, and we can do those big little things in life to make the world a better place, that helps everything, from freedom to people going to trial. In conclusion, like the woman caught in adultery, like Peter confessing faith in Jesus as Messiah today, like David whose sins were forgiven in the Old Testament, and Paul whose sins were forgiven, and God still called him by the Gospel to be the great ambassador to the Gentiles, we have received mercy like them, to show mercy to one another, to thank God that the foundation for salvation is not what we do, but solely and alone, the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. In His wonderful name, may God be praised. The peace of God that passes all understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds 
In the mercy of God, in Jesus Christ, amen.